tonight on News Center. Exactly one week left until Koreans head to the polls to elect the members of the National Assembly. The nation's key party leaders step up last minute efforts to win over the hearts of the voters. The race is way too close to call in a number of electorates. North Korea could deploy a new rocket system with greater reach as early as this year. Not to be alarmed, says South Korea's defense chief, as the South Korean and U.S. military forces are prepared for the new threat. And Korea's leading biopharmaceutical company gets the green light from the Food and Drug Administration for its first antibody biosimilar, making it only the second biosimilar approved in the United States. News Center begins right now. It is 9 a.m. in Washington, 2 p.m. in London, and 10 on a Wednesday night here in Seoul. Hello and welcome to our viewers all across the globe. You're watching Arirang News Center. Let's kick things off on the election front. We're exactly one week away from the 20th National Assembly election. Based on the nation's campaign rules, news media and survey outlets only have until midnight tonight to release poll results. Our Chi Myung Gil gives us an early peek at the public preferences so far, but it's just way too close to call in some heated battlegrounds. A poll conducted by Real Meter from April 1st to 4th showed the approval rating for the ruling's Henry Party was at 34 percent. The main opposition Minju Party of Korea, 27 percent. The minor opposition People's Party, 14.6 percent. And Justice Party, 8 percent. The conservatives' Henry Party's approval rating slid from 37 percent a week earlier due to infighting during the candidate selection process last month. The liberal Minju Party saw its rating edge up one percentage point from the week before, but saw its popularity decline in its home turf of Cholado province. And the newly formed People's Party gained 2.6 percentage points from the week before, while the ratings for the Justice Party remain unchanged. Looking at some of the most hotly contested districts, in Seoul's Nuansi district, People's Party co-leader An Chur Su has a slight lead of 0.2 percentage points over conservative newcomer Lee Jun Seok. In Seoul's core constituency of Jongno, former Seoul mayor Oh Se-un has a comfortable lead with 42.6 percent, outpacing his Minju Party rival Cheong Se-gyun, who has nearly 35 percent. And in Goyang A district in Gyeonggi-do province, Justice Party chairwoman Shim Sang-jung is in a neck-and-neck -neck race with Senuri Party rival Son bom gyu When asked if they will vote on election day, people in their 40s express the most interest in voting, with a participation rate of 64.4 percent, while people over 60 show the least interest with a rate of 50 percent. This is some of the last public polling data that can be released before an April 7th deadline set by the National Election Commission. Under those rules, the information cannot be published or broadcast in the six days before the election, though media outlets can cite polls taken before the deadline. Kim young Arirang News. With just a few days remaining on the campaign trail, party leaders are scrambling to drum up last-minute support for their candidates. As our Shin Semin reports, this time they're focused on their rivals' traditional strongholds. Less than seven days to the 20th parliamentary election, and the political party members are scrambling to win support for their candidates, bearing 20 to 30-minute schedule. Ruling party chief Kim Musang swept through Cholabukta province Wednesday morning, visiting Honam region for the first time, known for its strong opposition political party affiliation. Asking to vote for the Conservative Party candidates running in the region, ruling camp chief appealed to break down regionalism for the coming election. And the Conservative Party's election committee has released a fifth round of campaign pledge related to economy on Wednesday, vowing to ease regulations on independent business owners. 
The main opposition Minju Party of Korea's interim leader Kim Jong-in too continued a hectic schedule of campaigning, taking a tour around the capital Seoul, a key region where the outcome of the election is likely to be decided. Interim leader emphasized the party's goal once again at a televised discussion, saying that the election is not about the number of parliamentary seats, but is about how to save the country from such economic difficulties, calling to judge the Park administration's past four years. Visiting what used to be the Conservative Party's home ground, Minor People's Party co-chair An Chosu promised voters to overthrow the old politics and asked to fuel support to his party. Ahn told eligible voters that only his party can make progress in the parliament, where two-party system has been wasting time wrangling over matters regarding the people's livelihoods. He also proposed his negotiating party's counterparts to participate in a public debate where the party leaders can promise responsibility over their campaign pledges. Next up on the election calendar is the two-day early voting session that begins this Friday. Those who cannot vote on the election day can visit one of the 3,500 polling stations set up nationwide to cast their ballots. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And we continue with our election coverage for this installment of our four-part special. Our Park Ji Won breaks down the latest polling numbers in the nation's southeastern Gyeongsangdo province. Korea's southeastern region covering Daegu, Busan and Gyeongsangdo province has 65 parliamentary seats to offer. That's slightly over a quarter of the total 253 seats at stake in this election. The region has long been a staunch conservative stronghold, represented by President Park Geun-hye's hometown of Daegu with a population of 2.5 million. All 12 of Daegu's seats went to the ruling Senuri party four years ago. The ruling party had hoped to sweep the city this time around as well, but recent opinion polls suggest that it may be losing its grip on the city. The change is partly due to the party's factional feud over its candidate nominations, a process that excluded some of the region's most influential and popular politicians. For example, after three-term lawmaker Yoo Seung-min was left off the party's nomination list, he is now running as independent and is expected to win. An independent candidate is also making a strong showing in Donggu A district, where Senuri candidate and former public administration minister Jung Jung Sab is competing with an independent Yu Sang in a neck and neck race. Yu is a lawmaker who also left Senuri when he was left off the nomination list. Another exceptional race is taking place in Susang A district, where Senuri Party candidate Kim Moon Soo is trailing main opposition Minju Party candidate Kim Bu Gyam. Former Gyeonggi Governor Kim moon soo is considered new to the region and Liberal candidate Kim bu gyeom who is making his third attempt to run in the district, seems to be winning voters' hearts. In Gyeongsangdo province and the city of Ulsan, the ruling Senuri party took 35 out of 37 seats in the previous election in 2012, and it is expected to win 27 of the 35 constituencies up for grabs this time. In the more hotly contested districts in the region, independent candidates who left the ruling party after they were left off the nomination list are fiercely competing with candidates from their former party. In Busan, with a population of 3.5 million, the Senuri party took 16 of the 18 seats back in 2012, and the party is expected to do well again except in two districts, including Bukgangsao A. Senuri candidate Bang min Sik is in a tie race with Minju candidate Chun jae Su, who is running in the district for a fourth straight time. But voter opinion keeps changing, so it's hard to tell who will dominate this time around. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Well, President Park Geun-hye is back on home soil after an eight-day tour of North America. And what breaks down to two main themes, presenting a united stance against North Korea's nuclear program and making inroads to the Mexican market and beyond, our Song ji Sun has a wrap-up. In her first overseas trip of the year, President Park Geun-hye focused on security and the economy, two themes she has emphasized since the beginning of the year. Ahead of the nuclear security summit in Washington, President Park sat down with the leaders of the United States 
Japan and China to reaffirm their cooperation against provocations from North Korea. 저는 미일 두 정상과 함께 국제 사회가 북한의 도발을 결코 좌시하지 않을 것이며 만약 북한이 또 다시 도발, 도발을 감행한다면 북한은 더욱 강력한 제재와 고립에 직면할 수밖에 없을 것임을 다시 한번 경고합니다. At the summit, she said North Korea's accumulation of weapons-grade nuclear material, which goes against all of its international commitments, is a direct challenge to the global community. Over in Mexico City, President Bush shifted gears to business, laying a foundation for a resumption of long-stalled negotiations on a Korea-Mexico free trade agreement. This comes eight years after talks came to an abrupt stop following opposition from Mexico's automobile and steel sectors. Mexico is our largest economic partner, but it is still a very important part of the international relationship. This agreement helps the United States to win a peaceful a President Buck arrived in Seoul on Wednesday, just a week before the general election, which could determine whether her policy initiatives will get a boost or face parliamentary challenges. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. North Korea could deploy a new rocket system as early as this year that would expand its ability to strike South Korean and American military forces in the South. But no need for alarm, says South Korea's defense minister, as Seoul and Washington have been preparing for the new threat by upgrading their surveillance and counterattack abilities. Our national defense correspondent Kim Hyun-bin has more on what Minister Han Min-gu was willing to share with reporters today. South Korean Defense Minister Han Min-gu says that North Korea has completed testing on its 300-millimeter multiple launch rocket system and is likely to deploy it on the border later this year. He said, quote, North Korea has recently test-fired the system several times, through which I believe it has nearly completed the development. Under this assessment, I think North Korea will deploy the 300mm MLRS as early as at the end of this year. North Korea said last month that leader Kim Jong-un has observed the final test of the system, which has a range of 200 kilometers and could target half of South Korea when fired from the border. South Korea's defense ministry says the system is a cheaper alternative to ballistic missiles. The defense minister said the new weapons system is different from previous long-range artillery munitions, pointing to its range and destructive power, but added that Seoul is fully capable of defending against the threat because it has constantly upgraded its counter-artillery. The defense chief also said North Korea is capable of launching another nuclear test at any given moment, as long as its leadership makes the decision. Experts say there's a possibility North Korea could conduct its fifth nuclear test before its pivotal Workers' Party Congress in May, or to commemorate the birthday of its founding leader, Kim Il-sung, who is the grandfather of current leader Kim Jong-un, in mid-April. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. It's been about a month since the U.N. Security Council implemented the toughest set of sanctions to date on North Korea, and the UNSC is further tightening the screws. We're learning today that the United Nations is set to add even more items on North Korea's sanctions list on top of China's rare announcement of trade restrictions on Pyongyang. Our foreign affairs correspondent Kwon Suwa is live in the studio to discuss international measures on the reclusive state and how effective they are proving to be on the ground. Now, so at first, China. Beijing took a major step in implementing UNSC sanctions. Um, is it an indication that China is finally on the same page as South Korea, U.S., and other nations in pushing forward to put more pressure on North Korea so that the leadership gives up its nuclear weapons program. Most likely, Kanyang, because earlier there were doubts about whether China would really get tough on uh, North Korea, of course, because it is Pyongyang's closest ally. Now, to give you a quick wrap-up of Beijing's announcement yesterday, Beijing's Commerce Ministry has placed trade restrictions on 25 North Korean items, including rare earth materials, minerals and gold, as well as exports of jet fuel. Now, South Korea and the U.S. were quick to welcome the move. 
It's the first time since the UN sanctions took effect in March that China, on its own, has made such an announcement. We believe the measures will gain international consensus and make an important contribution to the full implementation of sanctions. Now, the U.S. expressed optimism over China's cooperation in curtailing the North's nuclear weapons program, but uh, also urged it to do more until Pyongyang has no other option but to denuclearize. Now, for Beijing, this kind of statement could be a burden. China is annoyed by the fact that it's often held responsible for Pyongyang's behavior. It's a burden. If North Korea conducts a fifth nuclear test, China feels it will be held accountable again. Well, so uh, um, the rest of the world remain concerned because China has a history of being quite lenient on North Korea when it comes to implementing sanctions. Exactly, Kanyang. But this time China uh, has taken a different course. So uh, let's take a listen to what an expert had to say about this. There have been some changes in Chinese policy towards North Korea. Uh, right after the fourth nuclear test, China was so very reluctant to participate in a very strong and comprehensive sanctions by international community towards North Korea. But recently, China, I think, changed its posture towards North Korea. Historically, I think uh, the Chinese policy towards North Korea is very much related to China-U.S. relations. Now, there are speculations that Seoul and Washington may have decided to hold off on the deployment of a U.S. THAAD missile defense system in exchange for China's follow-through on the sanctions. A sad deployment has been you know, deferred. I, mean, I don't think the U.S. would completely you know, give up the sad deployment issue, but at least now they have deferred it. They are not mentioning it anymore. So this is, you know, some kinds of, uh, you know, unmentioned, uh, you know, deal between China and the United States. So uh, uh, tell me, it's also a possibility that some sort of an agreement was made amongst the leaders of, of course, Seoul, uh, Washington, and, uh, and Beijing on the sidelines of the Nuclear Security Summit in Washington last week. Right, Kanyang, which uh, President Park Geun-hye, of course, uh, uh, just came back from after that, of course, he was in Mexico and uh, just came back from the Nuclear Security Summit where they did ha um, hold some uh, sideline meetings. And while President Park Geun-hye was in Washington, she called on the international community to put more pressure on North Korea. And meanwhile, over in New York, the, at the UN headquarters, uh, more sanctions have been added to Resolution 2270 earlier this week, which will soon be made public on the UN website. Now, according to an official, it'll include items related to regimes, uh, weapons development that were designated before, but put aside due to Russia's opposition. Well, so uh, definitely something that we'll closely be following in the next weeks or months to come. And uh, thanks so much for that very thorough wrap up. Anytime. Now, biosimilars are copies of biotech drugs closely watched by investors for their potential to take business away from companies making the original expensive product. An anti-inflammatory biosimilar drug made by a Korean firm has been given the green light by the U.S. FDA, making it only the second replica drug to be approved for sales in the U.S. market. Our Kim Min-ji has more on the entry in a fledgling U.S. market for lower-cost copies of pricey biotech drugs. Korean biopharmaceutical firm Celtrion's biosimilar drug Inflectra is set to hit the U.S. market. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration gave its final approval on Wednesday to allow sales of the cheaper replica of Johnson & Johnson's top-selling drug Remicade. The anti-inflammatory drug is used to treat patients with a number of serious conditions, including Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis. Biosimilars are biologic medical products with similar properties to ones already on the market. What's significant is that the Inflectra is the world's first Remicade biosimilar to gain a footing in the U.S., which makes up about 50 percent of the global replica market.
Celtrion expects to garner annual sales of up to $1.7 billion in the U.S. Not only is a replica similar in effectiveness and safety, it's also projected to be about 20 to 30 percent cheaper than the original. In fact, after sales began in Europe in 2014, Johnson & Johnson saw its overseas sales plunge. Last year, sales fell almost 19 percent on-year to just over $1.3 billion. And with the prescription rate of replica products at 88 percent in the U.S., it could deal further blow to sales of the original. Many in Korea are also hoping the approval of Inflectra will pave the way for faster development of other biosimilars produced by Korean firms. Currently, clinical testing is underway for 12 such products. Celtrion first received the thumbs up for Inflectra or Remzima, as it's known in Korea, from the Korean Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in 2012 and the European Medicines Agency in 2013. Pfizer, Celtrion's partner on Inflectra, will be in charge of marketing and sales of the drug, expected to kick off in the third quarter. Kim Minji, Arirang News. Well, yes, it tastes good, but we all know that consuming too much sugar is bad for your health. But high sugar intake has never raised so much alarm that in recent years as countries around the world began to take initiatives to reduce sugar intake of their people. As studies increasingly showed, a direct link of high doses of sugar with a wide range of health problems, including obesity and diabetes. Well, the Korean government is also joining in on that effort as this country also witnesses a steady rise of diabetes patients year after year. Our Kim ji reports. The number of Koreans suffering from diabetes has risen in recent years. The chronic disease is mainly caused by insufficient insulin in one's body and is the leading cause of cardiovascular disease, blindness, kidney failure and lower limb amputation. Those suffering from diabetes in Korea shot up nearly 25% in 2015 from five years earlier, affecting 2.5 million people. This is why it's quickly becoming one of the biggest public health care burdens. The National Health Insurance Service says diabetes-related medical expenditures in Korea jumped more than 33 percent during the same period to nearly 1.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2015. It accounted for 3 percent of the country's total health insurance expenditures that year. In response, the Korean government is set to announce a set of guidelines to increase awareness of diabetes in time with World Health Day celebrated on April 7th. It's expected to include tips and recipes to help reduce the use of artificial sweeteners in everyday meals, coffee, drinks, processed food and desserts, all to prevent obesity, which serves as a catalyst for someone to become diabetic. Although lowering sugar content in foods may not be a fundamental solution to prevent diabetes, it could help promote overall public health and healthy lifestyles and reduce consumption of junk foods, which could lead to obesity. The doctor says there are various reasons why people get diabetes, including genetic factors, but generally a healthy lifestyle coupled with daily exercise and consumption of nutrients and minerals from vegetables could help lower the risk of the disease. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now shifting gears, the civic groups and individuals from Korea, Japan and Germany gathered on this Wednesday to shed light on victims of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of women across Asia. Our Oh Jung Hee went to the site where a highly symbolic event took place today. At a regular Wednesday rally in front of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, civic groups from Korea and Japan took part in the laying of five copper plates in the ground next to the Comfort Woman statue to commemorate the victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery. These copper plates are called stepping stones for peace and serve as a reminder of the nameless Korean victims forced into labor during Japan's colonial rule. Three of the plates were made by the same people who created the Comfort Woman statue. They have the names, birth dates, and birthplaces of victims who, quote, stood to tell the truth about the past. The other two plates were created by a German artist, Günther Demnich, best known for creating stumbling block memorials for Nazi victims across Europe. The message on his plates read, in memory of the nameless Japanese sexual slavery victims in Korean and German.
the copper plates and the involvement of individuals and groups from Korea, Japan, and Germany now serves as another symbol that humanity moves as one united front in confronting sexual slavery. Japan's sexual slavery during World War II involved not only Korean women, but women from the Netherlands, China, and other countries. It's an international issue, and that is why Dean Nee contributed his work. The world now moves as one to help and remember each other's victims. Oh jung -hee, Arirang News. The Panama Papers scandal has toppled its first world leader. Iceland's prime minister has been forced to step down for his wife's offshore company. But the controversy seems to get more intense as more high-profile figures have been found to have bought properties in London with the money they saved through using tax havens. Hwang Ho-jun has more. The wave of fury towards the rich and powerful triggered by the publication of the Panama Papers has claimed its first high-profile casualty, the Prime Minister of Iceland. Sigmundur Gunnlaugsson made the walk of shame, resigning from office on Tuesday. The leak from Panama-based law firm Mossack Fonseca revealed that Gunnlaugsson owned an offshore company with his wife, but didn't declare this when he ran for parliament, which is seen as a conflict of interest. Gunnlaugsson says he sold his shares to his wife and continues to deny any wrongdoing. In the end, public pressure forced his hand as an estimated 20,000 people held a mass protest outside the parliament building in Reykjavik this week. The government has suggested a new interim prime minister, but protesters are demanding snap elections. Meanwhile, controversy continues to flare over the leaked financial and legal records, which indulge current and former world leaders who allegedly used the Panamanian law firm to secretly invest in London real estate. The advantage that Panama has is its particular secrecy laws, um, its um, uh, ethical shortcomings, the ethical shortcomings of its professionals, um, and some dodgy instruments that enable us to hide who really owns assets. Of the 30,000 offshore companies that own British properties, about 10 percent use the Panamanian law firm, the value of which adds up to nearly 7 billion pounds, or 10 billion U.S. dollars. The former U.N. Secretary General's son, the daughters of the president of Azerbaijan, and the sons of the former president of Egypt are among those that own properties in London through offshore accounts. Hwang Ho Jun, Arirang News. Over in the U.S., Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders have pulled off upset victories in Wisconsin in the U.S. election primaries. Uh, both candidates dealt significant blows to their closest rivals, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, while picking up some much needed momentum heading into the next round of contests. Oh Su Young has more. Over in the United States, the underdogs were the victors in Wisconsin's primaries on Tuesday. Texas Senator Ted Cruz scooped out almost half the votes, leaving Donald Trump with 35 percent, followed by 14 percent for Ohio Governor John Kasich. For the Republicans, it was a winner-take-most contest, with 42 delegates up for grabs. This has put the brakes on the momentum of Republican frontrunner Donald Trump, narrowing his chances of securing the 1,237 delegates needed to win the nomination and avoid a contested convention. Over on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders extended his winning streak to capture the primary with roughly 56 percent of the vote, to the 43 percent garnered by his opponent Hillary Clinton. That's good news for the Vermont senator, who was behind Clinton in the delegate count by 230. Sanders will need to secure major wins and a majority of the delegates in the remaining primary contest to win the nomination. For both parties, today's primary was a major contest for the presidential hopefuls, delivering some crucial momentum to the victors ahead of another major primary in New York later this month. Oh Su Young, Arirang News. Amnesty International says global executions reached a 25-year high in 2015. Bruce Harrison is live in the studio with me to discuss that issue. Uh, Bruce, uh, capital punishment has always been at the heart of controversy, but uh, which countries are carrying out more capital punishment sentences and, and why is that the case? It's interesting, Kun Young. Amnesty says actually just three countries are responsible for the bulk of the executions last year alone. That's roughly 
1,600. And even though China is considered the world's biggest executioner, Amnesty excluded it from its list because the true number of executions there are a state secret. Iran, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. Together, these three countries accounted for almost 90% of all the executions that we recorded in 2015, again, excluding China. In Pakistan, the government lifted a moratorium on the death penalty after a terrorist attack on a school in Peshawar that killed more than 130 children. But Amnesty says many of the deaths aren't related to terror. The Saudi Arabian authorities suggest that these executions are carried out to fight terror and safeguard security. But it's clear that they're also using the death penalty in the name of counter-terror to settle scores and crush dis dissidents. The South Korean government hasn't executed anyone since 1997, though the punishment is still legal. Seoul's been considering legislation to abolish the death penalty, and roughly 60 inmates here remain on death row. The United States was number five on Amnesty's list, though last year it posted a 25-year low of 28 executions. Myanmar Foreign Minister Aung San Suu Kyi says her government's ready to cooperate with every country in the world to pursue peace and human development. Suu Kyi made the comment during a meeting with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. He's the first foreign minister to officially visit Myanmar since a civilian government took power last week with Suu Kyi's close confidant, Tin Cha, as the new president. According to the foreign policy of our government, we want to cooperate peacefully with the world. We will cooperate for peace and human development. South Korea has had ties with Myanmar since the 1970s, and it's already interacting with the blooming democracy through one of its most popular exports, TV dramas. Well, uh, Bruce, uh, we've been seeing a sweeping popularity of, of Korean TV shows all across the globe, and, and now Myanmar. What is the market like there for K-dramas? Uh, well, it's pretty strong, actually. 90% uh, of TV series views in, viewed in Myanmar right now are Korean, and two shows will begin airing this month on state TV for, pre, for free as part of the push. Uh, so this is a way for the Korean government to build positive ties with Myanmar and take advantage of uh, the opening marketplace as well. Wow, 90%. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely uh, looking forward to see how those sh two shows will be received as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bruce, for that. No problem. Well, I can tell you we've been lucky enough to get a good run of some beautiful spring weather here in Seoul. For a check on how long that may last, we turn to Lee ji at the Weather Center. Now, ji warm, sunny conditions have been a welcome change. Definitely. And it's leading to cherry blossoms blooming all across the capital. But some areas are already seeing petals falling down from trees, especially in the southern regions due to today's rain, which really poured at times. Uh, but showers will expand nationwide, hitting the capital shortly. So by Thursday morning, southern regions could get up to 100 millimeters of heavy showers. But the bright side is the rain should let up by lunchtime giving way to mostly sunny skies and those rain clouds overnight will keep the temperatures on the mild side as daily low here is hot and Taejeon will start out at 10 degrees Celsius while Busan and Jeju will kick off at 14 and 16. Daily highs will be slightly lower than today but still quite mild as Seoul and Taejeon will be topping out at 20 and Daegu and Busan will see a high of 19 and 18 degrees Celsius respectively. Now this wet system will clear out the air and help ease dry conditions and highs will be remaining above 20s for the time being uh, making a perfect condition for spring outings. That's Korea for you and here's international weather for viewers around the world.
Well, April shower is in the forecast for those of you here in Korea, so I hope you check out the peak bloom of cherry blossoms before the petals fall off. That is our broadcast on this Wednesday night. I'm Moon Gun Young. Thank you as always for staying with us. We hope to see you same time tomorrow, right back here on News Center.